Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Hello, everybody. Today on This Jungian Life, we're going to be talking about Jungians on psychedelics, and I'll let you know that some of us have had first-hand experiences around this early in our misspent youth. We're going to be talking about the growing interest in psychedelics psychotherapeutically, but from a Jungian standpoint, it's particularly important because sometimes psycho psychedelic substances allow people's egos to enter into a relationship with the unconscious, which is central to Jung's ideas. We're going to talk a little bit about the ambivalence about using this in a number of different contexts, some of the positive stories, and we'll tie things up by analyzing a dream from a young person who's considering going into analytic training. So we hope you'll hang on for that. So I think we've known we were going to talk about this for a while, but um, I don't know. Now it just seemed like the right time. And uh, obviously very interesting. This is top of mind for many people. Lots of people are very interested in this. And of course, um, what is it? What you know, is it? <laughs> uh, it's some, you know, it's, uh, it's something that, that, that and people immediately think of Jungians when, when we think of, you know, psychedelic experience. And uh, so we're going to do what we do today and kind of circumambulate it. And I'll, I'll sort of start off by just saying that two out of the three of us have had a personal experience, at least one, with uh, psychedelic substances. Um, and I think all of us have um, family, friends, and, and, and Alizans also who have uh, used psychedelics. Yeah. And so I think we can speak to this process and, and this experience from, from a really wide variety of uh, perspectives. So. Hmm. so it's interesting that something that's been in the shamanic culture for thousands and thousands of years yeah, uh, gets suppressed like a lot of um, ancient practices, mm -hmm. and now is coming back up from the aquifer of the mm -hmm. collective unconscious mm -hmm. and demanding its place mm -hmm. as a healing modality. Yeah. Now, yeah, I mean that's right. that arc alone is really interesting. It is. Yeah, I know. I I got. Um, sort of more seriously interested in psychedelic experience a few years ago uh, when with a friend and colleague we made a trip to Athens and Crete. And uh, I came across uh, some books by a man named Carl Ruck, and you can find this uh, on the show notes in our book listings, about the Eleusinian experience, which was a an initiatory and kind of transcendent experience that took place outside Athens, Greece, for something like 2,000 years. And uh, the thesis in Carl Ruck's book, together with Gordon Wasson, who uh, developed LSD, and, uh, or I'm sorry, it was Albert Hoffman who did that, and Wasson who went to Mexico, but the whole adventure uh, in these substances, and there, the hypothesis is that uh, the grain barley that was used had developed a, a fungus, and it was actually carefully tended so that this fungus was exactly right in order to uh, give the participants who had prepared for this for a year and who walked 13 miles from Athens to Eleusis uh, in order to have this underground special experience. 
And I, I think I had not realized how ancient, how ritualized, how significant, how mythological, uh, and, and culturally meaningful because mm-hmm. it was a staple of, of, uh, ancient Greece society. Uh, this kind of psychedelic experience, uh, could be. Right. So uh, the and, hypothesis is that the Kikion gave one a psychedelic mm-hmm. experience, that they, the That's, Kikion that the yes. participants would drink. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> and, and there were theories about, um, early Christians having psychedelic experiences of, in the communion ceremony, et cetera. Now we all know today that there are indigenous communities that have been using, uh, mind altering substances for centuries and centuries and centuries. Tens of thousands of years. I yes. Think. I mean, I, I, I mm-hmm. <clears throat> in preparing for this episode, I was doing some research and, there is some speculation that there are some cave paintings uh, less, that, less that, show, that show that um, show mushrooms, and yes. uh, yeah, and that that's in Carl Ruck's book. Of there oh, are all kinds okay. of images of mushrooms, um, pottery, and so on and so forth. So, Interesting. but I I think um, you know with please forgive me for any little lapses that are uh, mm-hmm. factual, but the point is. Right. That these substances have been known around the world in yes. many cultures for thousands and thousands of years. Yeah, and I mean, just to... Here we're back at it again, yes. finally. Yes. Okay. Well, and just it's to say a little bit more forefront. about that. To say a little bit more about that, the um, of course, in... In South America, they, you know, they use peyote and ayahuasca in indigenous cultures. And in actually in Northern European cultures, um, you know, there's a, there's a whole really incredibly interesting thing about the myth of the mythology of Santa Claus. Um, and that that was related to the um, Lapland shamans who would use red and white mushrooms, um, that kind of classic red and white dotted Uh. mushroom that um that and and then this idea about kind of flying reindeer arose out of the use of um psilocybin so uh it it has it has roots really across Mm -hmm. the world in all kinds of different cultures and um and 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 it's it's uh, interesting to note, too, I think a lot of people are at least somewhat aware of this, that there was a lot of very interesting research going on on these substances in the 1960s. And then yes. there was a piece of legislation that came in, I think it was 1970, that shut it all down. The labs were all shuttered. This very promising research was stopped. And now it's beginning to be revived. Yeah. So it it yeah. is this kind of eternal story that these substances have kind of always been with us. And um I think part of what happened it was really during the Nixon administration that um these substances became illegal and partly because uh use of LSD in particular uh people were tripping and it was not protected by ritual and a religious purpose the way that it had been in indigenous cultures and way, way back in um, ancient Greece. So um, I think the alarm bells started to be rung, and what happened is what often happens, which is just shut it down, repress Mm -hmm. it, uh, eliminate it, and it went underground. Uh, you know, we we've all heard about hippie culture and you know all the stuff that goes on there. But I think something is being revived in the culture now, which is l- let's look again that there is something here that has a reality that has merit that can be used for seriousness of of purpose of how do we find a place that is neither just sort of careless, wild tripping, nor uh, let's never go there, of where where is there a more balanced 
uh, useful, purposeful, possible application for some of these substances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, let's start with um, people's concern. What what do you think people are worried about in terms of um, experimenting with psychedelics or trying it? What what's the big cautionary note? Well, I th- I mean I think there are some quite legitimate ones. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mean, first of all, you know the dangers of ketamine, for example, have sort of recently been in the news with yeah. the death of the actor. I can't remember his name, but he 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 died basically of um, the one who who was on Friends. Who am I thinking of? Anyway, who played Chandler, and I can't yes. think of his name either. Sorry, <laughs> but um, he, you know, he he died because of I believe it was ketamine toxicity. Yes. So it's it's not it's not that all of these drugs are um, sort of equally safe and wonderful and beneficent. Um, and and also, I remember Michael Pollan, who who wrote that great book, uh, How to Change Your Mind which we'll also include in our book list. Um, you know, he, he said that if, you, if you've got a really firm grasp on reality, you've got a strong ego, it, it can be very helpful to engage with these substances. But if there's any uh, question about how tethered you are, best to maybe uh, leave them aside. So I don't mm-hmm. know what the research is about um, psychedelics potentiating a kind of um, long-term psychic disintegration. But, but I know there's at least some caution about that. I think one of the things that um, I hear in the community, and I'll out myself, I'm one of the people that trip my balls <laughs> off through my 20s and 30s, um, <clears throat> is that there was a, uh, uh, a big difference between um, – what, what they would say, plant medicine, and then manufactured hallucinogenics. And I mm-hmm. think that um, while they still may create experiences that people find somewhat similar, like a, a dramatic expansion of sensory uh, perception, um, the plant medicine has been experimented with for thousands of years, while the kind of newer designer molecules have not. And so that's part of it. Like LSD is is fairly new um, by comparison with psilocybin, mm-hmm. and ayahuasca has been around mm-hmm. for thousands of years. So I think um, they are often lumped into one category. But for people who um, use this, particularly for indigenous healing ceremonies, there's a very strict differentiation between the mm-hmm. two, and particularly the archetype of the plant medicine. Is, is very specific that, for instance, mm-hmm. some of the shaman talk about ayahuasca as a kind of goddess. Yes, yes. That yeah. she is an yeah. archetypal entity. But I never mm-hmm. hear people talking about LSD as a kind yeah. of transpersonal personality. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, and they coined a new word, and I've forgotten who's responsible for this, of the entheogen that these plant medicines are entheogens, which is God creating, mm-hmm. um, you know, that honors the the purpose of ingesting this uh, as a spiritual quest mm-hmm. that requires preparation and a container, a guidance and reflection. But it's an interesting word. And I think you're right, Joseph, that it, it isn't used for so, some of the man-made substances, although perhaps it could be. But uh, it's a lovely word at, that bespeaks intent. Well, it's intent and, also, but we know that the archetypes pre-exist. Um, mm-hmm. So it's interesting that our culture, at least thus far, um, still evokes a certain kind of um, God image, a certain archetypal mm-hmm. dynamism around something that grows in the forest, something that can be composed from vines and flowers and plants. Mm. We seem to be very hesitant 
to assign gods to man-made things, like the gods mm-hmm. of cars. Um, no, has, <laughs> we, we don't. One we don't, could, we one don't could do justify it, it but, explicitly. <laughs> although everything, in a sense, has a kind of archetypal dynamism behind it, but uh, it takes, I think, uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of years for that to emerge in the collective. And going to what you were saying, Deb, is that the archetypal image is the mediating influence between the ego and the unconscious. And so there's something, just as Jungians, there's something containing and relatively protective about having some kind of an archetypal reference to a psychedelic experience versus something that is seen as purely empirical or purely Mm -hmm. uh, mechanical. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to take this moment in the podcast to insert one thought, which is I think it's easy <laughs> to get caught up in a kind of false dichotomy between like good drugs that are that are plants and, you know, bad drugs that are man made, because, of course, there are many drugs for all kinds of things that are man made that are really helpful. And I, I don't think that something is healthy for you just because it's a plant. Um, I actually have really strong feelings that I know will upset a lot of people, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, I'm, I have, I have concerns about, um, cannabis, um, and, and my concerns have to do with the fact that it, um, it can actually, there is a link between cannabis and psychosis and, and, uh, there's Mm -hmm. pretty good research about that. And I invite you to to just Google it. If you have any, if you're interested, I won't say more about that, but 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 I but I I don't want us to wander into the territory of anything that grows from the ground is is necessarily going to be just good for you. Um, but but yes, Joseph, I think I think in general, though, with that caveat, um, there is a way that these plants have been embedded in human culture, and you know, I believe that um, what you referred to about seeing the plant itself as as a, a a kind of God or a transpersonal entity. I believe that that has generated in around different substances in different cultures, if I'm not mistaken, which I think is really interesting exactly. that, that it, it is, there is something sacred about it, you know, so. Right. But it leans into, yeah. as I was saying, it isn't so much that everything that's quote unquote natural is somehow benign, right. but right. really what I was more saying is that because it's been in human culture for thousands of years, that archetypal images had time to um, emerge in the collective and that the images themselves act as something of a mediator to in some ways reduce the danger of psychosis is my personal theory Mm. uh, as a Jungian. Mm. That's interesting. That the lack of archetypal imagery actually makes us more vulnerable to being overwhelmed by unconscious content. Yeah, yeah, I think I think And that goes right to Jung's that, idea yeah. about the mythology. You know, we mm-hmm. teach uh, the the abandonment of mythology has left westerners vulnerable to all kinds of archetypal intrusions. Mhm. Well, that's and it, coming back to the yeah. No mm-hmm. god, go ahead. No, 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 coming back to what we were talking about before, which is really a more modern application of it. Well, I, I but, but I, I think I, in a way, I think in a way, um, you know, the modern application, it is the same as, you know, it, I mean, we, we hunger for the transpersonal. And we have it less in our lives now than certainly our ancestors mm-hmm. did. And there, there are some people who are real proponents of um, using kind of psychedelic assisted therapy who make this point, you know, um, Jungian analysts or those who are kind of Jungian adjacent, that, uh, you know, this, this could be a way to have access to the transpersonal. And it may be, as we've been talking about, a way that people have always accessed the transpersonal. I guess the the issue is, which I think we're all kind of coming back to, and Deb, you've made this point a couple of times, is in traditional cultures, there is a container around the experience. Yes. There's a there's both right. a kind of ritual container. There's preparation. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you're there with others. There's a guide. There's a reintegration process. 
But there's also a kind of um, cosmological or mythological container that yes, when you have these exactly. experiences, there is a there is a kind of coherent mythos um, that you can mm-hmm. attach them to. And and so the question is that as a modern with without a religious container, when you have these experiences, what do you do with them? I, I just think it's a question. Yeah, I th- I think all of this is really important of what you were saying, Joseph, and what you're saying now, Lisa, and what I've been saying is all of these mm-hmm. components need to be present. There's a mythos. Uh, and then there are human rituals, people, <laughs> containers. And if when it's used today for, let's say, end-of-life uh, therapy for people who have terminal diseases, there is preparation. There is a special room set aside. You are there with a guide, with a therapist, uh, so that you are not alone in it. Uh, there has been... There's a container and uh, an initiation, hopefully, into something transcendent, something life-giving, as the person in the room is facing uh, his, his or her death. So all of these factors really matter uh, in, in these kinds of experiences, and they matter um, and are determinative to some extent of what kind of experience you're going to have, you know, which takes me back to I have known a couple of people who've been uh, really damaged by casual, hey, let's give it a shot, uh, use of these drugs. And uh, you've already referenced the film actor who died from a casual use of ketamine. So uh, somewhere... You know, some real thought needs to go into what's my purpose? How am I going to do it? What am I looking for? And I think people are looking for the transcendent. They're looking for the numinous because we don't have cultural mythos. We don't have a a unity and uh, other kinds of of religious ritual containers. And uh, so we're seeking it in this other way. And uh, if we use it as individuals, I think we need to be particularly conscious uh, of what we're doing. One of the things that the research is bringing forward that I find interesting is that some psychedelics seem to um, constellate a neuroplasticity that the brain had when we were Mm -hmm. younger which allows a kind of fluidity of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So one of the uh, differentiations that I think you're talking about, Deb, is in that very um, fluid time period during uh, a a psychedelic experience, oftentimes the unconscious is very responsive. It's responsive to what we're thinking, it's responsive to context and the environment, and mm-hmm. that the environment can steer what is more likely to emerge in one way or another. So many of the facilitated experiences, for instance, in Michael Pollan's documentary, How to Change mm-hmm. Your Mind, they're highly curated experiences, mm-hmm. and the clinicians, from what I understand, are... Um, pulling little gentle threads to lead people into certain lines of inquiry, to look for certain things, like you said, the transcendental, or even specifically looking for healing, or specifically looking for insight. I think Mm -hmm. that when that kind of plasticity is opened up and people are, let's say, um, at a party, or at a concert, or in a park, or in the forest, and there is more of a they come in as uh, sojourners or as wanderers and are depending then upon synchronicity to constellate an experience, of course, it is more uncertain. And then we have stories of people having, quote-unquote, bad trips 
or people having certain vulnerabilities, uh, neurologic vulnerabilities that they couldn't have known. And then there's a a rare psychotic break. Um, Mm -hmm. We don't know whether that could have been uh, prevented had they been in a different environment. But there is that risk that I hear you saying. We do know that it can be precipitated by... Uh, by drug, by the use of these drugs, yeah, yeah. and you know, it's it in a way, it's very, very Jungian as a bedrock principle that you're accessing the collective unconscious mm-hmm. more than just your personal memories and so on. And in order to do that, you need to have a, a strong, flexible, well adapted ego that is going to be able to tolerate and contain. The contents of the un, of the collective unconscious, uh, and then make use of them, integrate them into consciousness. So, just jumping in um, w- without that kind of preparation, readiness, assessment of personal purpose, uh, I think can create, at the very least, a bad trip, and at the very worst, um, some long-lasting consequences. Yeah, in a so, worst case scenario, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So I just want to, I want to address some, first of all, this idea of the bad trip. And then I want to talk more about this idea about the collective unconscious, because I think that that is really super interesting. So, so first of all, I just want to say that, um, you know, I think it's possible to see quote unquote bad trips as not necessarily sort of like, oh, that was bad. That was a failure. But sometimes people have really confrontive experiences that are hellish, but, um, but transformational. So something gets, um, you know, there, there's some incredible stories in the book. Um, it's called sacred knowledge, psychedelics and religious experience. And we'll put that in the show notes as well. And, you know, the, the author makes this point that, um, that sometimes people have unpleasant experiences that nevertheless catalyze some needed confrontation. Mm -hmm. So d- just to make that point, but then, you know, another thing he says in that, in that book, which I think is like absolutely world shattering is that through experimentation with psychedelics, we seem to have been found empirical evidence for the existence of the collective unconscious because mm. people who are using these substances generate very similar imagery again and again and again. Now, this is no surprise to us as Mm -hmm. unions, because we know from dreams, by the way, which I I actually hope we can talk more about how dreams are kind of a correlate to a psychedelic. I mean, dreams are like the psychedelic experience you have every night, you know, and, and uh, (laughs) others have made this point. Um, So, but, but, um, you know, we know that dreams generate very similar imagery, mythological imagery. We know that the, the, the unconscious everywhere across time, across cultures will generate these same kinds of images. But there they are again in people's psychedelic experiences, which is super fascinating. So what I said before about how, um, you know, if, if you are a, an indigenous person in a culture, say, where ayahuasca is ritually used, it's connected to a whole belief system and a whole cosmology. Whereas if it's, you know, if you're a modern, you know, living in Philadelphia and you go do it and you're mm-hmm. unconscious or, you know, you have contact with the collective unconscious, which is essentially what happens. What do you do? How do you understand it? And I think that that is where Jungians are particularly um, apt to facilitate uh, this experience because because we have a cosmology or we have a belief system about the psyche that encompasses these kinds of experiences. And, and we can say, well, there it is, you know, there's this um, image from the collective unconscious appearing and we can help people make mm. sense of it. So, um, uh, you know, I, I think that um, that is really, really interesting that we could help connect these experiences to frameworks of meaning through Jung's insights. Yes. Yes. And we do that by ongoing weekly work with dreams. Yeah. Uh, yes. So psyche kind of, of mediates, regulates, and, and kind of scales 
you know, what is it you're ready to see, to hear, to learn, uh, to be confronted by, you know, whether it's a recurring dream of being chased by a mysterious and seemingly ominous something, and how do we work with that? Uh, and then you could scale it up to an experience with uh, psilocybin or or some other psychedelic substance. But but you know there are all different ways of having an experience of and a confrontation with the unconscious. I think that that I also want to say several things that I think are important. One is that. As Jungians, we're also interested in this because the definition of neurosis is that there is something that the ego should be aware of that has broken off and is somewhere in the unconscious. So any of the methods that allow the ego to come into a conscious relationship to the unconscious has the potential, it's not, it's not always uh, determined, but has the potential for some kind of a healing process. So whether it's um, drumming, whether it's hours of chanting, whether it's mm -hmm. uh, psilocybin, uh, breath work, dream work, anything that allows the ego to get a glimpse into the darkly splendid world, mm -hmm. so the occultists call it, um, gives us an opportunity to reclaim some part of ourselves that we've lost touch with. And that's one of the ways that we can imagine that this is very helpful. The thing that's really important is that many people, particularly in the modern world, have developed a particularly powerful and encapsulated ego structure for any number mm -hmm. of reasons. Mm. And so very well-meaning individuals who would like to become more aware of what's going on in the unconscious, struggle to remember dreams, don't have mm -hmm. easy access to their imagination, or, or simply are somehow blocked from that mm -hmm. opening. And so what uh, psychedelics sometimes can do is it can thin the veil. And so that even the highly defended ego or somebody's injured nervous system, as in severe PTSD, that keeps the ego in a constant hypervigilant state, yeah. finds that the psychedelics will melt something down for at least a while, which goes mm -hmm. to this idea of plasticity. And all mm -hmm. of a sudden, images, feelings, memories become accessible, and other kinds of sensations. And as you were saying, Lisa, some of these, the ego has been defending against mightily. Mm -hmm. And so the ego can find this uh, a frightening encounter, like many myths, where dragons and monsters and cyclopses mm -hmm. and, you know, creatures are encountered. The preparation, as you said, Deb, can also be having people be educated around the kinds of experiences that they may have have so that they don't become overly paranoid and they can keep some conscious mm -hmm. understanding of the different levels. It's when people get confused about the levels that they get in trouble. Mm -hmm. Like if we're hallucinating mm -hmm. something and we know we're hallucinating it, we have some footing. Mm -hmm. And so there's that um, quippy saying, I can't remember who to attribute it to, but the mystic swims in the same waters that the psychotic drowns in. Drowns in. Uh, mm -hmm. So this yeah. is where having orientation or wisdom before we mm -hmm. go into the unconscious, whether we're reading Jung's books or we have a, a shaman or some other guide, to have a sense of how to prepare so that we can stand in the images and sensations and not get knocked off our feet. Yeah, so <clears throat> Joseph, you know, talking about the thinning of the veil, that's what Jung referred to as the abysmal du niveau mental. And he was very interested in that state. And I think it was one that was really relatively easy for him to access. And of course, he has his confrontation yeah. with the unconscious in which he's engaging with um, figures from his dreams and from his imagination, and he's drawing them. And out of that comes the Red Book. And if you've actually read the Red Book or looked at the drawings, you, you really get that this, he was having, 
he was having experiences very much like one would have. In fact, I've I've <clears throat> I've heard someone suggest an analyst actually suggest that he may have been using psychedelics. I don't personally believe that was true, but I can certainly see yeah. why. I want to read Jung didn't write much about psychedelics at all. He didn't seem to he, I don't think he ever mentioned their kind of traditional even though he was very interested in um uh, the re religious and mythological systems. He didn't have, as far as we know, reference the use of psychedelics in traditional cultures, but he did write a couple of letters. And I'm going to read his letter to Victor White um, about this. It's not too long, but it's all of it, I think, is super interesting. He says to White, Is the LSD drug you're referring to mescaline? It has indeed mm -hmm. very curious effects, of which I know far too little. I don't know either what its psychotherapeutic value with neurotic or psychotic patients is. I only know there is no point in wishing to know more of the collective unconscious than one gets through dreams and intuitions. The more you know of it, the greater and heavier becomes your moral burden. Because the unconscious contents transform themselves into your individual tasks and duties as soon as they become conscious. Do you want to increase loneliness and misunderstanding? Do you want to find more and more complications and increasingly respons increasing responsibilities? You get enough of it. If, if I once could say that I, I had done everything I knew I had to do, then perhaps I should realize a legitimate need to take mescaline. If I should take it now, I would not be at all sure that I had not taken it out of idle curiosity. <laughs> I should hate the thought that I had touched on the sphere where the paint is made that colors the world, where the light is created that makes shine the splendors of the dawn, the lines and shapes of all form, the sound that fills the orbit, the thought that illuminates the darkness of the void. There are some impoverished creatures, perhaps, for whom mescaline would be a heaven-sent gift without a counterpoison. But I am profoundly mistrustful of the pure gifts of the gods. You pay very dearly for them. This is not the point at all to know of or about the unconscious, nor does the story end here. On the contrary, it is how and where you begin the real quest. If you are too unconscious, it is a great relief to know a bit of the collective unconscious. But it soon, soon becomes dangerous to know more because one does not learn at the same time how to balance it through a conscious equivalent. That is the mistake Aldous Huxley makes. He does not know that he is in the role of Zauberlehrling, sorcerer's apprentice. I probably totally butchered that German word. Who learned from his master how to call the ghosts but did not know how to get rid of them again. Mm -hmm. So Jung, I think, was very cautious. Yeah. I think we're we're echoing some of his cautions, but you know, I I think uh, maybe there are many poor, impoverished people for whom a psychedelic would be a heaven sent gift, because we don't have the connection to the collective unconscious that Jung did. Hi, listeners. I want to take just a minute to let you know about something really special that's going to be happening soon. Well, actually, two things. First of all, my new book, The Vital Spark, Reclaim Your Outlaw Energies and Find Your Feminine Fire is being published on February 6th. And you can pre-order it wherever you get your books. Um, and to celebrate the release of the book, we are finally doing something that I've wanted us to do for a long time. We're going to have a live podcast so you can sign up. You can get free tickets to come. It'll be on Zoom. It's going to be um, February 10th at 3 p.m. New York time. And uh, we will be discussing my book. We will take questions. And we'll also uh, take a dream from someone who's present at the live uh, recording. So uh, you'll have a chance to submit your dream that day. And uh, we'll just pick from from one of those and and do it. So I hope you will join us for this really special event. And um, just check out the link and um, get your tickets. Okay, see you soon. I'm thinking about um, that phrase in the letter that Jung wrote to Victor White about 
the pure gifts of the gods and uh, how in uh, Greek myth, you know, to see the god in his or her uh, full reality, you know, what w- was dangerous to, to mortals. And um, in one famous story, uh, the woman, Semele, uh, wanted to see Zeus in his full glory, and she was incinerated. So there, there is something about um, a judicious attitude and and that is that is all important and um Marie Louise von Franz echoes a lot of Jung's caution about you know how important the discovery of the collective unconscious is it's one of the most far reaching discoveries of recent times she says and i agree and uh and, and then she says um that recognition of the unconscious reality involves honest self-examination and reorganization of one's life. And it takes a lot of courage to take the unconscious seriously and to tackle the problems it raises. So uh, that echoes what you were reading, Lisa, about we can summon the ghosts, but then what do we do with them? (laughs) Uh, We're going to have to integrate those contents from the unconscious that we have summoned uh, from the depths, and I, I don't think this means I don't. I, I feel I've been a, a little sort of overly cautionary, I, and I don't want to banish these substances, our curiosity, and the very legitimate uh, uses to which they can be put. Um, but to go about it uh, uh, w- with intent and with consciousness and not out of idle curiosity. So I'd like to take a, a somewhat of a counterpoint because I agree with everything that you've said, but also millions of people have taken psychedelics in very casual yeah. environments and had very casual experiences. So, um, in fact, disappointingly so, I am among mm-hmm. those people. So, <laughs> I mean... <laughs> I mean, I was a real, um, I, I was a wide eyed spiritual seeker in my 20s and early 30s. And I was looking, I was looking to have the gods talk to me. And I was trying to, to break through into the next level. And, and I have to say that, um, the overwhelming majority of my experiences were far, far beneath. Um, the, a visitation by the gods. Um, so I think that um, mm-hmm. we neither want to exaggerate nor minimize yeah. what yeah. may happen with any mm-hmm. of these psychoactive substances, and not all of us are blessed or cursed with the visitation from the collective unconscious. One way that I've come to frame it for myself, and um, I'm far away now at 61. I'm far away from this culture. So um, I think there's much going on that I am naive about. But when I think back on my experience, I actually think that for most people, uh, psychedelics open into their inferior function, Hmm. which makes perfect sense to me. And of Mm -hmm. course, at the time, I wouldn't have thought that. But our inferior function, which is of our four functions, Thinking uh, versus feeling, intuiting, sensing, um, that the one that is least developed is the one that is most in the unconscious and is the easiest portal through which things can communicate to us. So for me, in my many experiences, they were almost always sensory experiences Mm -hmm. they did not evoke powerful feelings they did not Mm -hmm. evoke overwhelming imagery but i would have these very extraordinarily intense physical sensations that were Mm. even very difficult Mm. to contain in my body and then sometimes my visual sense would become marvelously enhanced and the, the smallest of objects would appear remarkably beautiful. Mm-hmm. 
a pile of leaves, um, grass, uh, flowers, uh, which really was, was an opening of my sensate function. Talking with other uh, individuals that had had experiences, again, that were not um, part of the collective unconscious, were not overwhelming, some people for whom thinking is their inferior function find themselves thinking that they're mm -hmm. taking psilocybin and they're pondering these very mm. abstract, wonderful archetypal mm -hmm. ideas and, and come out feeling that they've solved a secret. Mm -hmm. Some people for whom the feeling function is inferior may weep or laugh or yes. yeah. uh, be childlike in their emotional mm -hmm. vulnerability. But mm -hmm. that's because that's the gate into the unconscious yes. and other people have these paranormal intuitions that sometimes are shockingly correct, mm -hmm. uh, shockingly accurate. So that may change over time. And again, this is something I come to later in life, a perception. But again, from my sense, from my own sense, I would close my eyes and see intricate geometric patterns that were highly yeah. ordered. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, and I was like, I'm like praying to the gods, like, come and get me, man. I'm ready to go. <laughs> Joseph, I was 22. You're one of those people <laughs> that doesn't need um, a psychedelic uh, substance to have that kind of experience. Like, I know, you know, I've heard enough of your stories. You you have sort of non-normative experience, like fairly frequently, you know, I mean, compared to I, the average person I without found, substances. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I had to earn that because the substances it wouldn't yeah. do it. So then yeah, there's yeah. another 30 years yeah. beyond that of studying Kabbalah and learning to shift my consciousness right. at will. And you're right, right. There's extraordinary things that can be cultivated. But yes. um, but I, I want to just goes to say that there's a big spectrum of experiences. Mm -hmm. Yes. And and just to, I want to build on on what you're saying a little bit, and then maybe talk about some of the benefits. So I, I'm referencing a paper. I can link it in the show notes. It's a it was in the Journal of Jungian Scholarly Studies, and it's called Psychedelic Drugs and Jungian Therapy. And they make the point. Um, well, they quote somebody saying that the that the the psychological effects fall into four main categories: sensory, recollective, psychodynamic, which I've I've seen. I've had clients who um, had experiences where something from childhood really got imaged and then it could be worked with a little bit more, mm. um, effective and symbolic. And there's the feeling, you know, and then deep integral self-transcendence. So, um, so I think that actually there we have it, you know, sensing, um, thinking, feeling, and intuiting. Yeah. So, um, Beautiful. but, uh, so just a little bit more about the positive stuff and Deb, I know you have a lot on this too. One of the things, one of the points they make in this paper, which I thought was really well taken is that the, the, the bet that the therapeutic benefit seems to come from generating new insights in the user rather than, um, modulating, um, uh, neuronal stuff going on in your brain. So it's a very different therapeutic mechanism than say an SSRI. And, and I'll just uh, talk for a minute. I mean, th uh, apparently the research about the benefits of this on things from, you know, end of life anxiety to smoking cessation to treatment resistant depression, it's post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. A really, yeah, really, really, um, really significant. So very, very promising. Um, and, and I'll just say, um, personal story. I, this past year, I made a, a new friend, um, absolutely fabulous person. This guy is great. And, uh, when we became friends, he was just beginning to recover or, or I suppose had was in the recovery process of just horrific trauma, just horrific trauma. And I, I, getting to know him, I was like, are you okay? And, and, you know, he's like, yeah, I have my hard days, but I'm okay. I'm like, God, you know, now I think he's just a very resilient person as well. Um, but, you know, he said, 
plant medicine has been really important for his healing journey. And I was like, mm. wow, that's, you know, not surprising actually, and, and really impressive. And, um, you know, the, the research shows that the effects can be long term, that there's the mm -hmm. experience yes. and there's kind of an afterglow, yeah. but that some people kind of touch back to this for weeks, months, even years. Uh, so it really is kind of a, a shift. Now, I also happen to believe that doing, for example, dream work can create a similar shift. I think we're kind of doing the same thing when we do regular dream work. But um, yes. it, it's, yeah. it's the, you know, Jung says it's the contact with the numinous that heals. And whether that numinous experience comes through your dreams or through uh, a substance, you know, there it is. There's what he said. So. I think that's the best case scenario is that we have a visitation mm -hmm. from the self. Yeah. And of yeah. course, I think what we're being cautionary about is that the collective unconscious is a repository of many things, yeah. men, many of which are not the self, and can have a disintegrative effect. But in the mm -hmm. best case scenario, this unifying energy that is intimately connected to our unfolding can draw close or close enough to have a mm -hmm. powerful effect which can still be turbulent because it mm -hmm. makes a demand for growth i mean that's the that would be the, the best most wonderful version of that i i would also like to tell a few mm -hmm. stories of friends that have uh, had mm -hmm. extraordinary experiences which yeah. um some of which were sobering, but I found remarkable. One of my friends was um, came out of Iraq and um, had a number of very difficult experiences, but in the military there, the experience that he um, changed him was um, mm. performing his first kill. Oh. So... And even though in these experiences are sanctioned by the government, maybe even were considered mm. necessary, you know, in wartime, oh, heroic, it changes a person to to have that archetypal experience. It changes their soul. That and many other things were quite challenging. So, individual. Um, was separated, you know, wound up retiring, medical retirement, and was um, deeply troubled. So found a community in Peru that were doing ayahuasca work. First thing that was interesting is that when they were interviewed, and there's a, in this particular organization, it was a very, very intricate interview process. And one of the questions that the shamans asked is, have you ever killed someone? Mm -hmm. And the, this person was sitting and wondering if, because they didn't want to be disallowed, but in the final analysis said, yes, yes, I was, I was in the armed services. And the shaman said, you can't, you can't do this. That you, you're, mm -hmm. you don't understand what will come back to you if oh, you wow. were to have this experience. And we don't believe that it would be good for you ultimately. So my friend was distraught and made a good, strong argument that he was stout enough, and he was, he was correct, stout enough to have this. So the shamans um, consulted among themselves and said that they, they would permit him to do this, but on the caveat that he would have to submit to being withdrawn from the process by them, at their discretion if they felt that this was going to a place that mm -hmm. wasn't going to be good. Mm -hmm. And and so he's down in Peru. Just as you said, there's this preparatory process. They uh, made him drink this volcanic water, which was this mm -hmm. overwhelming uh, purgative uh, substance. So it's just days of purging in oh, the body. Um, and nurses coming to check on them which was interesting, this uh, mix between the experiences. Wow. And then after that purgative experience, they're 
taken off into the jungle into a compound, a group of uh, perhaps ten of them. And um, there's much to say. He was wonderful about um, recording all of this at the end of each day. It was a remarkable storyline. But um, but he was hunted in his visions, literally hunted mm. in his visions, and wow. and feeling this um, predatory energy that each time he went into the altered state was constantly um, coming at him and for him to contain his own sense of horror over and over and over again until he could finally submit to the full sensory experience of being killed, which is the inverse mm -hmm. of the experience that he had participated in. And because yeah. the full sensory immersion in the experience, it wasn't academic, it wasn't like a virtual reality game. Sure. And he experienced it in his skin, experienced his heart stopping, experienced um, the explosion of organs uh, in, oh. in a, in a s screaming kind of psychological agony. Uh, oh. At this point, the, apparently the shamans, oh. all the shamans are around him. They're chanting, they're intervening, they're doing mm. doing the incredible work that they could do to help contain this experience. Mm -hmm. and, and this is very congruent with what Jung said about dream work, is that often that the self will grant us mm -hmm. the inverse experience in order to create an uh, equanimity in the ego. That, mm -hmm. uh, and that often happens in very subtle ways, because many yeah. of us don't live in such polarities. And so he came out of the experience uh, um, I think in his own words redeemed. <laughs> that that he That's very beautiful. felt that in some way he had suffered adequately mm. something that the uh, individual mm. that he had killed in wartime had suffered and had still had m several years of processing something so extraordinary, but sure. felt that he wasn't sure that he would s submit to such a thing. This was a 10-day process. Every mm. day for 10 days they went into these states, confronted over and over again by these inner um, images. The shamans felt entities that ayahuasca mm -hmm. herself had come mm -hmm. to him and made him know and experience what he would not have been able to access. Right. The thing I have to say, much to say, but this fellow, uh, I mean, I enjoyed him very much. He was lively and creative and really appealing. But when he mm -hmm. came back, he was lovable. Uh, which is very hard for me to say that there was such a there was such a vulnerable spirit that came forward that had broken free mm. in the ayahuasca experience. Mm. Oh, I see. That there was it's, this uh, heart more connection. More of him was available. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think lovable sounds like trite, but I don't mean it that way. That no. that it was it was possible to love him and be loved mm -hmm. by him in in that agape wonderful human embrace and i mm. think that the um the wound of wartime had walled him off uh from mm -hmm. the the goodness of even other people now this mm -hmm. is my words i i don't know whether he would say quite the same thing but subjectively mm -hmm. that's what i felt and mm -hmm. so he went through what i suppose anybody would say is that bad trip, which goes to what you were saying, Lisa. Mm -hmm. But he he chose to put himself through but, something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But what that's a really, really moving uh story. Yeah. Uh and what I'm aware of is he went to Peru. Yeah. With such seriousness of purpose. Absolutely. 
And that when uh, he was first told that he could not do this work, uh, he, he, he made a case for himself. Um, so he, he took it very, very seriously and did what I would consider just an enormous piece of personal work uh, around uh, his experience and the trauma of having been a soldier and having killed someone. And and he was ready to do it with help. I, I love the image of these 10 shamans around him chanting. Right, just helping him uh, as much as they the, could. The, and the, yes, of course, uh, he was changed in a way that you could perceive, and obviously he could perceive. Um, and he, he was somehow ready f- for it. And he chose it. And he chose it with real uh, consciousness and dedication, flying to Peru and do, yeah. doing all of that. It, that in itself is a story. Um, you know, versus some of the more perhaps casual attitudes, and that when we open ourselves to these archetypal realities and images, uh, we we need to be ready for what we're going to receive because we don't create that. Yeah, we are subject to we. J- and Jung says that, you know, that he had in his years that he called the uh, confrontation with the unconscious, uh, he walked up and down and he might, you know, we could say, my gosh, was he really, you know, on some substance and he was not, that he had the capacity consciously to engage images from from the unconscious. And he said he realized there are things in the psyche that I do not produce, Mm-hmm. but produce themselves. Right. And uh, he had this vision of this uh, figure called Philemon that had wings like a kingfisher. It's in the Red Book. You can Google it. It's a famous image that Jung, after he experienced Philemon for the first time, painted it in order to really get it into consciousness and to work with it and to uh, integrate it into into his uh, awareness, and he said Philemon represented superior in- insight. At times, it seemed to me quite real, as if he were a living personality. Mm-hmm. I went walking up and down in the garden with him, and that he was to me what the Indians call a guru. So we we open ourselves to these things, and Jung writes about times of of having really felt that he lost his grip on reality and that he would have to recite to himself, my name is Carl Jung. I live at, uh, you know, this street address. 16 C. Strasse or whatever, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. So um, what, what a huge mm-hmm. journey and how moving, but what a huge journey this man went on. Absolutely. To find that wholeness. But Deb, you brought up something that I do want to spend a moment with, which is that um, all of us who have experienced early trauma, and Jung was one of those people, Mm -hmm. um, find that we survive, and and I'm speaking also from my own trauma history, Mm -hmm. that we survive by breaking into the inner world very mm. at a very young age. Mm-hmm. We do this instinctively. Kalshad writes about this, that we find um, altered states and inner worlds to retreat to to survive. Now, later on in life, if we're lucky, we find mm-hmm. mythologies or we find Jung's writings and we begin to chart these places that we retreated to and we get some mm-hmm. facility about moving 
into them and out of them, of course, so that we're not stuck in them all the time. So Trome Bernstein has a book, uh, Borderland, where he talks about any of us who discovered the thin places as children and still carry this exquisite uh, sensitivity to the inner worlds. For people like Jung, sometimes there is the path of stepping back into the concrete world, that developing a facility to be able to move through that liminal state. So there's a portal in, but there's a portal out. And when we read some accounts of Jung's two years, particularly where he was excruciatingly captured in the inner worlds, um, just night after night, and the despair, the feeling tones particularly that he talks about, that he was having these agonizing feelings that were not connected adequately to imagery or memories, and that just um, were torturous to him. That finally, of course, the dreams provided some symbolic images which gave him some mm-hmm. respite, which goes to what we were saying right at the beginning of our episode, that we need image and cosmology mm-hmm. in order to contain these unconscious affects. But secondary to that, some of us do have access through trauma to the inner places, Mm -hmm. and we have to go Mm -hmm. through a very similar process of mapping and understanding and developing facilities so that one is not trapped on either side. Because Mm. so much of what's happening in the Western world is we're trapped over here uh, in the sensory world, and, and the world is only what my senses report. And the interior is just invisible to us. That's a form of being trapped. Yeah. Being trapped in the liminal place where I've got one foot in, one foot out. It's not so fun either, if that goes on right. for years and years. Yeah. And of course, being trapped on the far side and all the, all the fairy stories of being trapped in the fairy mm-hmm. world. And that's mm-hmm. bad news as well. Mm-hmm. But the, the wizards and the shamans and the priestesses of the traditions had this way of of coming to an understanding of how to walk through and walk back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. The pythonesses that's, that's of Apollo. They walked mm-hmm. through, they prophesied, and then they walked back into the world. So it's being, and that, and that's what we must all do. The realms. Yeah. Between that's the really, worlds. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, Joseph, that's really lovely. And I, I, I like your framing very much. And I, I, I do your discussion of trauma, I think is just, you know, just right. And it could be that early life trauma, I, I believe this absolutely actually, uh, you know, creates that channel to the, the thin, you know, the place is thin. And, and that's why people with early life trauma often have really kind of ex- some extraordinary abilities. Um, and and it could be that our experience with psychedelics um, has to do in part with the nature of our relationship with the unconscious. And that if yes. you have a trauma history or a terrible mother complex, let's say, that, that you're going to have one kind of experience with all this. And whereas if you, you don't have a trauma history and, and let's say that you have positive parental complexes, it it might be a little different. I mean, I mean, I think I just want to kind of offer a counterpoint, maybe just a, another a personal story about someone that I know, a young person that I know who you know I think is is pretty solid and kind of had good good parental experiences. Um, uh, you know, he did it casually, just with friends. You know, and I, I was asking him about it, and he and he said, um, he said it, it was it, it he said that. It was cool to see the walls melt, but that wasn't the main mm-hmm. thing. I said, well, what was the main thing? He said, it's ineffable. Mm-hmm. He said, I, I know they say it cures PTSD. I can't speak to that, but I can tell you that it cures atheism. Oh. And he said, um, he said, I, you know, I, yeah, I thought it was a really lovely way of expressing it. And he said, you know, I, I always thought of religion as being, you know, rules and thou shalt and thou shalt not. He said, but but really religion is about pure love. 
And I thought, well, that <laughs> that, that seems like it was worth the price of admission. <laughs> no kidding. So, That's our true so, initiation. Yeah. Yeah, but it was but it was undertaken casually, you know. Um, and the so, self can and, and, slip and in I'm, through I, any open window. And 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 I mean, I think it's interesting and worth mentioning that because I I guarantee you, a lot of our listeners will have done these drugs casually, and some of them will have had really amazing experiences. So, mm -hmm. um, but maybe maybe uh, if you have a certain psychic predisposition you're more likely to have that kind of experience whereas if you have a different kind of psyche because of trauma you might need more of a container i, I know it's a little mm -hmm. mysterious but um just maybe raising questions mm -hmm. it's and it also points to having a thoughtful a thoughtful orientation yeah um which doesn't yes. have to be exalted yeah or too casual, but to to know, and I think most people do, that we are courting the extraordinary. Yeah, that's which is, I think, it. the whole draw. Oh, I and think sometimes that's sometimes we're episode disappointed. Title. <laughs> courting yeah. the extraordinary. Yeah, I'll write that down. Yeah, and I think your point, Joseph, that you made a little while ago about uh, being feeling trapped. Uh, yeah, we're trapped. that was great. It, we're trapped in a world that venerates materialism and sensory experience. And, you know, a, a, you can make your own list. Um, but this is, it, we're not in a culture that is unified as ancient culture in Greece was, for example, around this ritual. It was the glue that everyone knew about, everyone was eligible for this. If you were a citizen or if you spoke Greek, whether you were a slave or some part of nobility, uh, that there, was a, a, there was a cultural container. And I think in today's world, we, we long for and are courting uh, the inevitable, the extraordinary, the transcendent, the numinous, we want to know that there is something something more. And to to have an experience that's initiatory or or confirming of uh something greater. Absolutely. And and this is at the core of all Jung's work, is that um human beings were meant to be egos mm -hmm. that are having experiences of the inner worlds. However we um, contextualize that as dream work or even just fantasy, as Jung said. If we just pursue our fantasies, we will find some part of ourselves yes. at the end of that yep. road. Yep. And so the, anything <laughs> and all the things in our modern culture that seem to be um, truncating, seem to be pushing the ego away from that dialogue with the unconscious is a problem. And for instance, I would say, I know I, I sound like I'm beating a drum, but the hours mm -hmm. and hours that kids are playing with online gaming, that's someone else's fantasy. That's mm -hmm. right. And, and I understand that it's fun, it's exciting, it's wonderfully crafted. But I have many clients who are under 30, and their imaginations are populated by images yeah. of games that they've spent 10 hours a day planning. And there's wow. very little room for the, for the uncanny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there's very little room for the spontaneity of the unconscious. And consequently, there is also an enormous rise of interest in psychedelics. Because now there's even another wall to have to break yep. through yes. in yes. order for the autonomous psyche to say hello. So I want to, I want to go there for a second and talk about this because, um, and this is a big idea, but, but, and we've been walking around it some, but with the loss of containing um, religions that offer us the uh, experience of the mystery and the transcendent and the loss of, mythological symbols that religion is based on that are kind of meaningful 
Um, <clears throat> this is, I'm reading, reading a little paragraph here from a book called Confrontation with the Unconscious. And again, we'll put it in the book list. But, but that with the loss of these symbols, um, th- this, is a, this is kind of a, a, a catastrophe for humanity because we need this somehow. So here's, this is reading from the book. Those symbols form a bridge to the archetypal depths of the unconscious, Jung maintains. But such, such bridges are currently in a state of collapse, and no individual is personally responsible for this disaster. At the same time, we need to appreciate that the individual's unconscious will try to rebuild those broken connections. We need to understand, that is, the attempts at restitution and cure, which nature herself is making. So what this author is saying is that um, in dreams, but perhaps also in our um, reaches into psychedelic experiences, you know, we're, we're desperately trying to build those bridges back. And uh, now I'm going to... Um, I want I want to read something from the journal article I mentioned before. The door to the inner world that psychedelic drugs offer may be more important and val- and valuable now more than ever before to challenge the dominance that the conscious ego has acquired. Mm. Uh, the spiritual hunger may be the deeper reason for the renewed interest in research in psychedelic drugs, which I think Joseph is exactly what you're saying. Like yeah. we're our egos are so strong and, and we're so kind of protected in some ways uh, from the um, incursions from the collective unconscious. And some of us have a lot of trouble remembering our dreams. I think one of you made yeah. that point earlier in the episode. It's like, where do we find that contact? And we need that contact and we need those bridges. And perhaps this is, this is a way. So. That's uh, it's real. That's really very interesting. That our egos, our strong, uh, capable egos, can trap us. Yeah, and get trapped that on psychedelics this side. are are a way to finding our own interiority, mm-hmm. uh, which we're more and more isolated from because of how busy we are, and online gaming, and and all of that kind of thing. Uh, that we want to break through, yeah, uh, as yes. a as a count, uh, you know, as a compensatory effort of how distant we are. We need to do something to just punch through, and and connect and find a different reality. And that it's not a reality we're reading about only in books or conceptual. Just right. as the whole basis of Gestalt is that a single lived experience has so much more impact than Mm -hmm. uh, reading, considering, um, talking about. So for somebody to have a single experience of, you know, I went out into the forest and and the tree was glowing when I was, I don't know, taking LSD. Maybe that's the only (laughs) thing they ever did their whole lives. And maybe they can discount it as a, some kind of a hallucinogenic endeavor, but somewhere in their imagination, there is a glowing tree mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that a they can't bush. deny that they didn't experience, <laughs> yeah. even if it was mm-hmm. induced. And mm-hmm. then that means something, the uncanniness of that. Um, and I've used this term before, but it re-enchants the world. Yeah. And the enchanting of the world is to restore this, yeah. as you were saying, Lisa, mm-hmm. a mythic feeling. Mm-hmm. We're not saying abandon science or empirical proof, but our while our outer world needs to deal with science and facts, the inner world actually needs much more latitude. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's lovely, the mythic feeling, yeah. and I think that's just right. And I yeah. do want to say that I think it is possible to re-enchant one's life with a mythic feeling by reading fairy tales and yes. attending to your dreams and um, cultivating a relationship with the natural world and cultivating a relationship with your interiority. So I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm certainly open and interested in what psychedelics can add, but I, but I don't think it's uh, the only way. And I, I do want to say here, yes. here's the other point that I want to make. And, and then I, I think I'll, I'll have said what I want to say today, mm-hmm. but um, 
my concern about the way psychedelics are being talked about in the culture right now is that they are being presented as the answer. And I think as a culture, we are very susceptible to seeing the answer in a substance. Yes. So it is, um, you know, it is, it can be commodified. Um, you know, it can, it can then, we can then be told just like anything else that gets advertised to us. Think of all those pharmaceutical ads that this substance is going to change your life. And then in the words of one of our colleagues, I really liked this phrase, we want to be changed without having to change. Mm -hmm. And, yes. and that, that this, um, this kind of fits into our kind of, I want to say drug seeking paradigm in this culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, I'm, I'm reading here again from that journal article, because I really like how they, they say this. The concern is that the ego will in a subtle way, destroy what it feels and does not understand. Calshed and others warn of how readily the ego can trivialize spiritual experiences and use a shallow search for superficial religious experiences defensively. So it's not like um, y y we can misuse this psychologically and, and we can can trivialize it and also expect that it's somehow some kind of magical answer that exists in the form of a substance that we can ingest and then just be changed. So. And I have to say, absolutely. If tripping my balls off was going to turn me into a guru, I would be levitating right now. I mean, <laughs> the amount of LSD and psilocybin that this poor nervous system has ingested, I should be transformed. And I still needed a long, yeah. long analysis to get my shit together. So yeah. I can I can say with absolute confidence that just being exposed to uh, hallucinogenics is no guarantee of enlightenment mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. all. Yeah. Right. So it goes to what you're saying is it isn't a panacea. Yeah. Wish it was. Wouldn't that be fantastic if that's all? And, it and, I, be nice. and we have a yeah. tendency to see that, right? Like you've seen this with the decriminalization of marijuana. Um, you know, now suddenly like cannabis solves every problem. It's going to make you sleep. Yeah. It's going to make you calmer. It's going to make you happier. It's going to, mm -hmm. it's, it's like the list of things that it's supposedly going to cure. It's like, really? Right. I mean, I, you know, it's yeah. not that I don't think there are probably beneficial uses of it, but it, I think we're really susceptible because of yeah. our dependence on, on drugs, basically of various kinds. We're really yeah. susceptible to thinking the answer is going to be in a substance. So, so what I'm, what I'm aware of is, uh, the tendency to externalize. Yes. That's well uh, that that it will be out there yeah. or it will come from someone or something, and that ultimately, uh, whether it's uh, the use that your friend made of ayahuasca and, and going to Peru, of uh, what e enormous personal work he engaged in, or whether we do our own dream work um through an analytic process or lots of other things that you mentioned lisa ultimately this comes down to what is between you and you and how do we relate to our own interiority how do we integrate contents of the personal unconscious and the collective unconscious there's no getting away from our having to work with ourselves and psychedelics can be an aid or not, and a hundred other things can be aids or not, right. but we, we have to go there uh, to our own depths and engage ourselves. And if so we I want access done, to those I, inner I, worlds, <laughs> good. And if yeah. we want access to those inner worlds with regularity and control, we actually have to earn yes. that. Yes. yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Got that's great. <clears throat> so I, I said I was done a minute ago, but Deb, you just, even though you made a great summary, <laughs> summary statement, I just I thought of one more thing. You know, really, well, this is what Michael Pollan says, right? That the benefit of these drugs probably comes from, I think he uses the term, a perspectival shift. And actually, lots yes. of things can bring that about. Like travel can actually bring about a perspectival mm -hmm. shift. 
reading really good novels can bring about a perspectival shift. Right. And, and, and what that looks like um, in terms of the neurobiology, and this, again, is one of the things that Pollen talks about is um, <clears throat> these drugs, uh, one of their effects is to suppress the default mode network. And the default mode network um, is kind of like, a it, it's a correlate roughly to ego. It's what we use for engaging a task. It has to do with our sense of identity, our, um, our, our reverie and our self-talk. So it's, it's a really important part of the brain, but, but it can get us into problems. I mean, if you think about like obsessive rumination, that's also in the default mode network. And that's one of the things kind of, OCD type traits that um, these drugs can help with because it kind of bumps you out of that and it kind of quiets the ego, which I think goes back to what you were saying, Joseph, about being able to walk back and forth between the realms. And it's, you know, it's the whole basis of Jungian work, which is what is the relationship between the ego and the self or the ego and the unconscious. And everything we do in a Jungian process is around forging a flexible relationship between the ego and the unconscious yeah. that both are there. It's, it's, it's perfect to what you said, Joseph, about not being trapped in one side or the other. So anyway, um, yeah, I just wanted to bring that in about the default mode network. So maybe it's time to go trip into a dream. <laughs> And before we jump into the dream, I would like to remind people, we haven't talked about it recently, but our dream school is up and running. It's a wonderful opportunity for those of you that want to enter into a relationship with the inner world safely and knowledgeably. <laughs> and you can do that. Yeah. Um, so you can go to our website, this com. click on dream school give you a bunch of information about it. It's a self-paced course, and there are communities to interact with. There's live Q&As. There's an opportunity to interact with all three of us within these forums. So mm. if this conversation has been interesting to you, please consider dream work as another step in that direction. Yeah. So today's dreamer is a 30-year-old male who is unemployed. And here is his dream. I'd heard about a hotel that was luxurious and impressive, and though I knew I wouldn't be allowed in, I went anyway. I entered the lobby, which was enormous, and where everything was a warm shade of brown or gold. An employee approached me and politely told me to leave. I said I would, but then snuck on the elevator when he wasn't looking. I pushed the button for the twentieth floor, but it took me to the nineteenth, where the door opened onto another elevator which went up one last floor. I wandered the hallways for a while until I got to the corner of the building, which was a kind of open common space with couches. Off to the side was a janitor cleaning, who I passed on my way to look out the window, but who stopped me before I could reach it. He was a large, oafish fellow like Chris Farley. He jerked and stretched his body around to do his tasks, overexerting himself, in a way that I think was meant to be funny. When he bent a certain way, I could see he had on lacy, pink women's underwear under his jeans. We spoke for a while, but I don't really remember the conversation. At the end of it, we agreed that he'd be better off working the same job, but in a movie theater. I left, going back down the elevator, and again it took me to one floor before my destination, or I had to enter another elevator to get to the lobby. I crossed the lobby and exited the building out onto the street. For context, he writes, Incidentally, I'm considering training as a young Ian analyst. So far the applications are going fine, but in some mysterious way this seems to have brought out a lot of things in my personal life. Personal conflicts, family drama, etc., he says his main feelings in entering the lobby, he felt some anxiety about being caught for doing something that he shouldn't be. Otherwise, there weren't many strong feelings. He was struck by how airy and light everything was. He adds a few associations. 
I live in a major city, and I would associate the Dream Hotel with one of those old, upscale hotels downtown. Places I could never afford to stay. Chris Farley is not an actor I think about very often. As a matter of fact, I don't find him very funny, and when I think about him, I think mostly of his substance abuse and anecdotes I have heard of him playing nasty pranks on people. So, interesting dream. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, um, I think this is one where I I have a kind of gestalt about it. Um, Yeah, mm -hmm. me too. Why don't you start, Deb? (laughs) Um, I'm really putting all of this, uh, you know, first of all, I'm thinking about uh, he's in a hotel. So nobody lives in a hotel. Uh, It's a space where... You know, people are between point A and point B or some such thing. Uh, It's luxurious and impressive. And uh, Dream Ego is not quite sure he belongs there. He's told to leave and he sneaks on the elevator and he goes up. So there's a lot of elevation uh, here. And uh, I, I am tying it to what he said in his comments about wanting to train uh, as a Jungian analyst. Because when he finally gets up to the 20th floor, who does he meet? A shadow figure in the form of this uh, janitor. Um, I'm sorry to say I don't know who Chris Farley is. I'm a renegade from um, current cultural (laughs) popular figures, I'm afraid. But but here is this man who prevents him from looking out the window and is behaving in this peculiar way, wearing lacy pink women's, women's underwear. And he'd be better off working in a movie theater. And then back down goes our, our dream uh, ego. So, so I'm thinking about, you know, uh, you know what? What is all this going up, going in the hotel, and this encounter at an elevated space with somebody who's anything but, you know, what, do, what kind of meaning do we make of that? So I, I think you and I are thinking along the same lines, but I, I think I have a few different thoughts about it. So first of all, I think the entry into this hotel it it does feel like this little mythologem of the uh, the guardian at the threshold. Like, no, you're not mm-hmm. allowed. And in myths and fairy tales, it is the right thing to do to go ahead anyway. So mm-hmm. it's this little bit of audacity that mm-hmm. says, you know, um, I'm going to push through that. And I, I thought it was really kind of a lovely thing that the first elevator gets him almost all the way there, but not <laughs> quite. You know, there's a, there's a kind of a two-step process. He gets up there and Chris Farley, I had to look him up. Um, but, but I, you know, I don't, I don't know that my brief look on Wikipedia helps me a whole lot. There's already stuff in the dream. He's, he's sort of a, uh, kind of loud and, and a little bit, um, It's a broad physical uh, comedian, physical yeah. comedy. Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, who died of a drug overdose actually. Um, but, but, uh, so, so Chris Farley is a shadow figure. He's also a bit of a trickster and he contains this hidden feminine element. He has access to the feminine cause he's got these lacy pink panties on. So, I mean, I do think that the, the wisdom, the kind of medicine in the dream comes from the figure of the janitor which is um you're you're right Deb that it's not it's not an exalted figure it's someone that the dreamer needs to get acquainted with in himself what i i am not sure about is what it means to say well you're really better off doing this in a movie theater and so i i'd be curious you know if i had the dreamer here i'd say well, what's the difference between the hotel and the movie theater why would it be better to go in the movie theater what is that difference i don't know that i have a, a an intuition about that Well, I'm thinking about, you know, what does a janitor do? Um, 
that janitors take care of maintenance. Uh, uh, maintenance, mm-hmm. you know, that has to do with cleaning things and, you know, ma- making sure everything works, um, solving, you know, problems with with uh, plumbing or other mechanical features of a, of a space. It's a very practical, literal, hands-on k- kind of job. And I'm thinking the difference between a hotel and a movie theater is a hotel is someplace, you know, that you stay while you're on a trip or between two different locations. And a movie theater is a place of fantasy. Uh, it's a place where there are shows. Um, and so I don't have mm. a, a quick take on, oh, this means that, but, but that, that would, that that's interesting, a place where there are, are images and visions and stories, narratives, mm-hmm. fantasies, mm-hmm. Uh, versus a, a place dreams. where you reside, albeit, right, a place of dreams. Mm-hmm. Whereas a hotel, you reside there, albeit temporarily. Well, and, uh, and as you're talking, I'm thinking like the hotel has status. This hotel is... Um, the is, upscale is a kind of hotel place, yes. Whereas a movie theater yeah. is not particularly, but so I like what you're saying about the movie theater is a place of dreams and mm-hmm. fantasies. Yeah, yeah, stories. Mm-hmm. So, Joseph, myths. what are what are you thinking? Um, I mean, I really align with all the things that you guys had said. It's such a wonderfully unlikely character. To, to come across. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, in one sense, I wonder if there is an ordering process that's going on that Chris Farley is a movie star. So mm, he's in the wrong place. Like, what are you doing here <gasps> in the hotel that you should be associated with the movies? So um, what I wonder is if the Chris Farley figure has become, inside of him, has become overly concretized actually needs to be moved back over into this entertainment character place. Um, Mm -hmm. So there's a a subtle, it's not a very dramatic, but a subtle sorting, getting things in the right place that are in the wrong place. The idea of the wearing of the underwear that um, Mm -hmm. heterosexual men who wear um, their wives' underwear, for instance, find it sexually exciting, not because they're cross-dressing, but because of the idea that the underwear was was pressing up against their wives' genitals or a woman's genitals, and now it's pressing up against their genitals. So that the underwear becomes a kind of symbolic representation of the female genitalia. So it's a form of, um, it's a way of uh, maintaining a kind of low-level sexual stimulation secretly over the course of the day. Now, that's not true for everyone, but it is for a number of people. Um, So there's something about uh, Chris Farley in this dream being under-stimulated. Farley was obese. He was troubled. Um, We could almost say that if this represents the shadow of this young man uh, who's unemployed, Although he aspires to be an analyst, there's something very earthy. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, in the Shakespeare um, uh, comedies, there there are the ruffians, you know, mm-hmm. that are... Uh, uh, and the people Falstaff. Gonna, Falstaff, Malvolio. Um, they're kind of clown figures, um, but they play an important role. Often they are tempting people to come down into the base level, come down and and be on the ground with us and Mm -hmm. let's get drunk and let's play and party. Mm -hmm. And often the protagonist needs to somehow be brought into that world and then fight their way back up to a higher level of functioning. There's an irony that, just as you guys have pointed out, that he ascends into this very fancy environment, but what the dream maker wants him to see is all of this is maintained by something that is very earthy, 
Yeah, yeah, and of course, yeah, yeah. this is yeah, that's <laughs> this is the reality. Actually, all the fancy yeah. stuff that people want to stay, you know, just one door away, or all the or all the staff working really hard and scrubbing those floors and painting those walls. <clears throat> These uh, castles don't spring out of nowhere. It's all on the backs of people mm-hmm. working really hard. So yeah, I also wonder oh, if sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. If being an unemployed young fellow, then he needs a dose of his inner janitor. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> pull up a mop and a bucket and a broom. Let's set aside any fancy notions and just start sweeping and scrubbing um, and, and finding your relationship to the world that you are in, which, just as you were saying, Deb, is to maintain. Let's let's look at maintaining the world around you as a place to get your feet on the ground. Being a janitor is also a very sensate task. You know, you're dealing with objects that are around you that are that are rather concrete, or repairing them, or cleaning them, tending them, picking up after other people. So there's a quiet, unassuming energy about that. And even though Chris Farley is goofy and silly but still he is he is the janitor so to me it seems like you need a dose of the janitor stuff there's a little bit going on here about something around uh, sexual excitation and the relationship to the feminine and a difficulty in connecting to the feminine so such that um there's something fetishized perhaps mm-hmm. a little bit um, in the underwear, and that he's in relationships. So he and Chris Farley had a little tete-a-tete, and they mm-hmm. both mm-hmm. decided, I like it that nobody gave any orders. They said, we all mm-hmm. agreed he'd be happier, you know, being a janitor in a movie theater. And what I would imagine the difference mm-hmm. might be is there's just a lot more engagement in a movie theater. You know, being a janitor in a hotel is a pretty lonely thing yeah uh, you, there's not a lot of people to engage but if you're there with all of the crowds of people coming in and out and there's entertainment and energy and uh, the dynamism of the dionysic theater there's there's okay. something a little more enlivening in that world so i think something work is being done on that very um grounded um layer inside of himself Lisa, you had something I think you wanted to say. Yeah, to me, um, as you were talking, what came up for me is, you know, it's sort of like the trope of the the young person shows up as an acolyte to be initiated. And the the old wise, the wise old man says, you know, here's, um, you, you know, here's, here's a bucket, you know, start, start, uh, start polishing the car or start sweeping Karate the floor kid. or, you know. Yeah, right, right. Which I never saw, wipe but I, on, I've wipe heard off. You, that you've described yes. that. You know, because he's going over to the window, right? You're on the 20th floor. What do you do on the 20th floor? Is you want to go see the view, but the janitor mm-hmm. stops him. So right. it's sort of like, yeah, you, you know, it's a little bit like um, when the the knights of the Round Table were going to set off on the Grail quest. They were given a vision of the Grail, but then they had to go and traipse through the brandles and the marshes to find the Grail. So he's risen, he's ridden up to this 20th floor. Ah. He's about to get a, a view of what it's like. And it's like, no, 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 no. That's, you don't get it yet. You don't get to enjoy that view yet. You've got to go back down and be a janitor and, and be in the imagination rather in the exalted kind of status place. Um, you, you have to kind of, uh, there's, there's other work that needs to be done first, but I, I, if I had to say, if you pressed me and said, is this dream, what is this dream telling this person about training? It's like, yeah, it might be the right path and you're going to have to shift your attitude a little bit. Much more like janitorial work. Right. It's not fancy. There's going to be a lot of sweeping up of other people's spilled popcorn. (laughs) (laughs) And that's on a good day. (laughs) <laughs> there's also the sticky soda <laughs> and the gum under the seats and yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jungian training is, is, is 
Not fancy. <laughs> You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.